This is episode 203 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Stem Cells and Science Communication with Dr. Paul Knopfler. Hey everybody, we are Drs. Dalon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have one of the original science communicators himself, Dr. Paul Knopfler. He's from UC Davis on the podcast to talk about his research on epigenetics and stem cells and cancer, as well as his work in science communication and advocacy We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, as research using pluripotent stem cells advances towards the clinic, there is a renewed focus on cell quality, as we all know. Visit www.stemcell.com slash cell quality to explore ways to assess your human pluripotent stem cells and learn about essential quality attributes to consider for gene editing, disease modeling, and cell maintenance. All righty, so in talking about translational approaches, the first study, the first paper I'm going to talk about today in the roundup is a heart-centric paper that is taking a very unique approach to cardiac regeneration. The title of this paper is Reversible Reprogramming of Cardiomyocytes to a Fetal State Drives Heart Regeneration in Mice. Okay, and this is something that's taken off in the in the stem cell field uh, recently, I think there's been a lot of press and interest in using the Yamanaka reprogramming factors, these factors we all know and love that are used to make iPSCs, right? Using them for therapeutic purposes. I remember sometime last year, there was a paper that came out of uh, David Sinclair's group over at Harvard using OKSC over expression in the eye and actually showing that if you do that, you can rejuvenate the eye after an injury mediated phenotype. And then there was a, a that startup company that's been, you know, catching the public's attention that came out public in like a few months ago, talking about using Yamanaka reprogramming for rejuvenation and aging and studying aging and that sort of thing. And in fact, Yamanaka is even on the board of that company. So this is sort of in that same line using these really powerful transcription factors, not for SOX2, KLF and, and MIC. Um, to in induce rejuvenation in the adult heart and in mice in particular. So, you know, I don't necessarily have to frame this too much. This is something we've talked about quite a bit on the show. We actually had Ken Poss, who's talking about how heart regeneration is a holy grail and some organisms like zebrafish can do it really well. Adult humans, of course, can't. And it's a huge unmet medical need because after you have a heart attack, myocardial infarction, the cardiomyocytes in your heart aren't gonna come back, right? So we gotta figure out new ways to restore proper heart function after myocardial infarction, after cardiac injury. And this is where these folks over in the Department of Cardiac Development and Remodeling at the Max Planck Institute, in Germany uh, are uh, taking OKSM, these transfer factors, and using them for cardiac reprogramming and regeneration. First author is Jan Puchen. Last author here is Thomas Brown. So of course, cardiomyocyte replacement is really slow in adult mammalian hearts. And regeneration is non-existent in adult human and mammalian hearts, right? But fetal hearts, as we know, actually have some intrinsic regenerative capacity and that's owing to the presence of these less mature cardiomyocytes that still have the ability to divide. That's one of the hallmarks of adult cardiomyocytes is they don't divide, but these immature fetal cardiomyocytes do. And even IPS, because IPS-derived cardiomyocytes are immature, they have an enhanced division capacity as well. So here they're actually showing that when you do a heart-specific overexpression of OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMIC, OKSM, it actually drives adult cardiomyocytes to de-differentiate and it confers a regenerative capacity in adult hearts. That's really neat, I think. Um, when you have this transient cardiomyocyte ex specific expression of OKSM, it can extend the regenerative capacity for postnatal mouse hearts and even induces a gene expression program in the adult myocytes that resembles that of the fetal myocytes. So you're basically getting a reversion back to that fetal state. Um, there are certain problems with this approach, though. If you extend this expression way too long, it's going to lead to uh, 
like cellular reprogramming way beyond what you want. And ultimately they found that this process can lead to heart tumor formation or quote unquote cardiomas, I guess you call it. You don't get heart tumors very much in part because the cells of the heart, the myocytes of the adult heart don't divide, <laughs> but you're actually getting definitive cardiac tumors if you did this kind of stuff for way too long, okay? So, but if you do a short-term OSKM expression before and during myocardial infarction, uh, it actually can help reduce some of that cardiac damage and improve function too, showing that if you time it right, if you time it right, this OKSM-based overexpression may actually help out with cell cycle reentry of adult terminally differentiated cardiomyocytes and maybe lead to improved cardiac regeneration, improved function, less scarring, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the reality is, is this something that I would want to receive in my own heart if I had a heart attack? Uh, the idea of getting heart tumors is a little scary because if you got a tumor on the heart, that's going to cause a lot of problems for the electrical conduction pathways, even just the overall contractility, all that. Uh, I don't really want tumors on my heart, Dale. I'm just saying. Yeah, me neither. Um, but I got to hand it to these guys. They they did something unprecedented twice, I guess. Either solving the problem that no one's been able to solve on the one hand or creating a tumor where nature has not been able to create tumors. You don't get heart tumors typically. Um, well, nature's probably smart, doesn't want to get those tumors. But, you know, on a serious note, I think that, um, that while I'm impressed with the kind of, I guess... Uh, you can't call it the therapeutic potential because as you just discussed, it's not really ready at all or close to safe. But um, I would have liked to see more, I think, on kind of mechanistically in this in this story, how you get about to go about reverting to that fetal or neonatal state because, you know, clearly the neonatal cardiomyocytes aren't expressing, I don't know if they're expressing any of these factors, but clearly not all of them. So this is not like a physiological mechanism. Um, it's some kind of chromatin bending, right? Uh, and also it's a, it's a precedent that already exists in the neonatal heart. So I was hoping to have the oxum there as kind of a gateway to reverting and then finding a surrogate that was perhaps either more physiological or less, you know, pluripotency, something that was more specific to the heart. Because, you know, as you said, this isn't really therapeutic at all, I think, in its current state. And given the impressive result of being able to recapitulate or endow the adult heart with this neonatal phenotype, it would have been interesting to follow up and see what, what's going on there with the chromatin, what kind of gene expression is uh, being restored um, and, and how. Because that, I think, really is the path, right? If we can uh, restore the neonatal phenotype without uh, having any kind of tumorigenic potential, that I think would be the best case. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's speaks to the power of OKSM. I mean, like you said, it's chromatin bending. I mean, that's one of the major emphasis and like the, the perhaps the true power of the, the Yamanaka factors is that, you know, clearing out the epigenetic state in the terminally differentiated cell types. So to kind of get a deeper dive into that would be really cool. And I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing this. Like I, I think this is super cool. The fact anything that's, you know, leading towards enhanced cardiac regeneration is a big plus in my book. I, I just feel like, you know, the, the emphasis here should be more on the basic science and the beauty of the the, the, the basic science in the study, like, you know, even the work that Dr. Poss is doing, I, I don't know if you can directly today translate some of the, the work that he's doing into people, but just to identify these mechanisms of like enhanced cardiac regeneration is just so, so powerful. And yeah, maybe down the road, we'll, we'll figure out how to make this a reality. I don't know. I'm hoping so. Um, I have a similar related story about induced reprogramming in C2, although this is a neural story. And I, for one, um, would argue that this is maybe more therapeutic in its potential. You know, like the heart, the uh, central nervous system lacks a robust, at least intrinsic regenerative capacity. Um, so you can't really get functional recovery from injury, but there's an emergence, emerging approach ever since the days of Marius Wernig and the induced um, neural cells uh, to instruct fake conversion of, of cells in the neuro nervous system. You know, you get brain resident, for example, glial cells, and then turn them in 
to induced neurons by direct in vivo lineage reprogramming and similar ideas to what Arun just discussed in the heart. Um, many groups are looking at this in many systems. Uh, and there's been considerable progress made in generating these functional induced neurons uh, in the mouse, of course, in the cortex, in the striatum, in the spinal cord. I think we covered a story about spinal cord here on the show. Um, but there's still a lot of questions as to whether these induced neurons have, uh, you know, the capacity to promote functional recovery in the context of these pathological conditions. And there's been a lot of like injury studies, um, particularly there in the spinal cord. But in the context of uh, pathology, I haven't, haven't really looked at that. Um, and, and the real measure there is to see in, a, you know, in the context of an ongoing pathology, if these induced neurons can, can stably integrate within the disease system and, and establish some circuits there. Uh, so uh, with that being the open question, a group led by Christoph Heinrich at the INSERM in France, uh, they looked at this induced neuron therapeutic paradigm in the context of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis. All right, we're calling it MTLE for my sake. Um, it's a well-characterized uh, epile epileptic syndrome, um, and it's the most common form of focal epilepsy and also among the most treatment refract refractory forms of epilepsy. So uh, a, a major unmet need there. Uh, and what the group shows essentially is that by... Um, using retrovirus here. Uh, so we're not exactly ready for prime time, but I think, you know, this is more uh, proof of principle, but using this retrovirus driven expression of these specific factors, not oxen, uh, ASCL1 and DLX2 in uh, hippocampus, in the glia of hippocampus, um, in, in the hippocampus in C2, or in uh, these cortical astroglia that they graft um, into the epileptic hippocampus, and they show that there's efficient reprogramming into these induced neurons. They look like interneurons, uh, and these induced interneurons, they integrate into these networks in the epileptic uh, hippocampus and establish synapses. Um, and here's the punchline here, is that they show a significant reduction in mice. Uh, there's this model of this MTLE in mice, and they show significant reduction of both the number and the duration of spontaneous recurrent hippocampal seizures. So big deal, I think. Anytime you're doing anything in the neural space, it's, it's really, I think, impressive given the complexity of the problem and the apparatus there. But also, I just think, you know, two factors here, using glial cells that are plentiful and I don't want to say dispensable, but there's plenty behind. Um, I think if we could work out a more uh, efficient and robust delivery uh, system here, that this would be a, a big and uh, major entry into the therapeutic landscape. Yeah, this is a cool approach because you're ameliorating the disease phenotype. Um, you know, really nifty based uh, basic science study here. Certainly, yeah, of course, there's the issue with the retrovirus. And I think down the road, they're going to look into like, you know, more targeted ways of delivering these things. I don't know, even modify RNAs, AAV, nanoparticles, all these good things, right? So the clinical translation is probably way down the road. But, you know, even on the basic side of the, the story, the one question I did have, and in fact, they didn't bring it up in their limitations, is what glia are they actually reprogramming? It's, it's not something they specifically looked at, right? They mentioned that there's a bunch of different types of dividing hippocamp hippocampal glia, like the astrocytes, NG2 glia, microglia, but which cell types are they actually converting into the INs? Um, so maybe that's going to impact the downstream you know, amelioration of the disease pathology, all that good stuff. So uh, really cool study. Just a couple of, you know, down the road questions for me. Yeah, you make a good point. I mean, I'm, I'm championing this as ready for therapeutic time, uh, prime time and all that, and maybe throwing some shade on the oxen. But it, it's a similar issue, right? The oxen, you're worried about the cells you induce, what they might become. But here, if you're reprogramming anything in C2, you got to wonder you're getting the tissues you want, but at the expense of what cells. So it's a, it's a point, it's well taken there that we got to really focus on. It, it's, you know, with any system, there's a problem. If we're delivering something 
that we're culturing in vitro. I'm I'm always worried about what's the the you know how the fidelity of those cells. But when we're converting something in C2, we also got to wonder too. So yeah, uh, nothing's easy in this game. But I, I think um, some amalgam of of many of these moving parts will ultimately lead to a, a robust solution. Yeah, sometimes you know cells are there for a reason, and even bringing it back to the heart. I know uh, Deepak Shrivastava has his own direct reprogramming based approaches of directing, directly converting fibroblasts into functional cardiomyocytes in the heart. But you know, you you need fibroblasts for that su support structure in the heart, and they are, you know, important for other aspects of cardiac physiology. Um, one thought is you could just convert the fibrotic, the the fibroblasts that are causing the scar formation directly into new myocytes. But you know, these targeted approaches are they're tricky, you know, especially uh, when maybe the cell types that you're hoping to reprogram are actually doing something important in the context of that organ. So we got a lot of work to, to figure out down the road. So staying in cell stem cell, another paper I'm going to talk about from cell stem cell is a, it's a unique um, approach, a unique basic science study titled TIRNA signaling via stress regulated vesicle transfer in the hematopoietic niche. This is coming from the lab of David Scadden over at Harvard. First author is Yumna Kafori. Um, I, I really like this story because, you know, exosomes and extracellular vesicles have gotten a lot of press as of late. These are those things that are secreted by different cell types and they're carrying cargo that may be able to deliver messenger RNA or instructions to another cell type um, to have a bunch of different downstream uh, processes being impacted, right? And so this is an EV story, extracellular vesicles. Um, but in vivo, we still need to figure out how extracellular vesicle transfer is happening. What are the different cargo components that are being shuttled by these EVs and these exosomes? And what disease context, what organ context and developmental context too? So here they're actually showing that the osteoblastic cells in the bone marrow are uh, giving off extracellular vesicles that are taken up by hematopoietic progenitor cells, actually in vivo. This is happening in real time in vivo. And the cool thing here is that under genotoxic or infectious stress, um, these secretion of these EVs, these extracellular vesicles, is increasing, right? So it's a stress-mediated response. And it's these EVs are being transferred to these hematopoietic progenitor cells, and in particular, the granulocyte monocyte progenitors. And the, the other cool thing is what these EVs are actually containing. They're containing processed transfer RNAs, tRNAs, you know, those RNAs that from bio 101, they're carrying the amino acids, tacking on new amino acids to the amino acid chain, forming a new protein during protein biosynthesis at the ribosome, you know, those tRNAs. So those are the tRNAs, processed tRNAs that are actually being carried by these vesicles from the osteoblast to the hematopoietic progenitor cells, okay? So they are transferred to the granulocyte mon monocyte progenitors. They're actually directly increasing protein translation. So it's almost like you're getting a kickstart in these HSCs uh, after the vesicle transfer, like uh, directly just shuttling cargo there just so that the machinery can immediately start making protein, right? And that's driving cell proliferation, myeloid differentiation, all these different blood phenotypes. And uh, upregulating the EV transfer also improves the recovery of the blood system after genotoxic injury and actually survival from a, a fungal sepsis model that they actually had here, which can obviously negatively impact the blood in a pretty significant way. So this EV-mediated EV mediated tRNA transfer, is it's a stress response process. It's a stress response signaling access. In addition to all those usual cytokine hormonal response pathways that are uh, critical for you know, regulating stress response, uh, totally separate from that approach. Um, it, this is cool to me. I had no idea something like this existed, that you could actually use tRNAs in this way as a stress response pathway. For me, as a signaling guy, I always thought it was all about the cytokines, the, the growth factors that are causing the downstream you know, stress responses and all that. But hey, tRNAs are important for more than just putting together proteins you know, in 
in bio 101 i suppose <laughs> yeah i like the uh this idea and its simplicity you know you need help mobilize the trnas and, and like a direct handoff of cargo um but that you know exosomes were i don't know when but it was everybody was talking about exosomes just because it was it was kind of mind-boggling that you had these dumb particles you know that didn't have any kind of any kind of uh, nucle nucleic acid, well, nucleic acid, but no DNA um, driving or the traditional apparatus of the cell driving uh, the, the, the signals and decisions there. Um, and then I don't know that they faded, but you don't hear as much about exosomes nowadays. And I wonder, it's just because it's really hard, I guess, to uh, mechanistically and in a careful way with genetic models in mice to control uh, the the production and secretion of these extracellular vesicles. And it's one of the things I think importantly that uh, Scad mentioned here at the end of the story is that, yeah, those, those, those mice don't exist where you can knock down or overexpress vesicles in a specific cell type by using some uh, fundamental element of, of, of the exosome production process. And I, I think that maybe that's why uh, the, the momentum has not kept behind uh, vesicles, but I think the therapeutic potential is just around the corner. I know there's a lot of groups and startups that are focusing on these EVs or exosomes um, for delivering cargo, but I guess just it's, it's, it's frustrating that we can't get to the level of mechanistic detail that we'd like by using these traditional genetic mice models. Yeah, we know that these things do something and they have, as you can see, a pretty powerful impact on cellular function and overall disease physiology, pathophysiology, all that. But you're right, it's, it's, it's the tools. It, a lot of this comes down to the imaging tools, the tools for manipulation to actually better understand how these EVs, these exosomes are, are transporting, shuttling cargo. And if you just think about it, it's like a little bubble, right? Studying such a transient little bubble in an in vivo context, that's exceptionally difficult. So hats off to the SCADN, work, SCADN group for this work. Yes, you know, just the most recent in a series of amazing stories from the Skadden group. Um, staying in the blood, I've got a story about uh, leukemia here. This is where blood goes wrong. Um, and we're talking about chronic myeloid leukemia here, which is a stem cell driven myeloproliferative disorder. Uh, and, you know, it was a lot worse uh, years ago before the introduction of imatinib, and then there's been subsequently some second, third generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors that really transformed the way that we manage um, chronic myeloid leukemia, CML. But uh, the reality is now is that their resistance emerges to these therapies even, and only 10 to 15 percent of patients with CML uh, achieve sustained remission. Um, and even those, they require lifelong TKI treatment, um, and that has a lot of side effects. And, and the reason for that is because you have these kind of resistant clones, right, that emerge, um, and leukemic stem cells are the basis of that. And they're inherently insensitive to TKI treatment. It's been shown by many groups. Um, and part of the reason why their incentive is autophagy, okay? So autophagy, uh, as I'm sure everyone knows now since it won the Nobel Prize, is this conserved catabolic process whereby you maintain cell cellular energy during starvation, metabolic stress by removing re redundant components from cells like protein aggregates, organelles, or mitochondria. Um, and there have been a lot of preclinical studies that have shown that autophagy uh, plays a cryoprotective role. So it protects specifically in the context of cancer. So cancer cells will use autophagy, autophagy um, to escape uh, therapies. Um, and there's this kind of in, uh, autophagy inhibitory factor that you may have heard of called hydroxychloroquine, um, not here in this case used in the context of COVID. But um, it's been shown in a lot of preclinical cancer models that hydroxychloroquine um, can inhibit autophagy and then it can uh, kind of be used as an adjuvant to prevent that escape of, of some cancer cells in, in certain models. But uh, when those uh, trials have moved into clinical stage one, two, 
they they haven't shown the same efficacy. So there's this real need to develop more potent compounds um, that can inhibit uh, autophagy and prevent this escape apparatus in these uh, specifically in CML, but also in other cancers. Okay, and and to that end, uh, G. Wigner Helgeson and his group um, at the University of Glasgow in the UK. They focused on this ALK complex, ULK1. Um, it's one of the first uh, critical steps in autophagy. And because it's a serine threonine kinase, it's druggable, right? Um, so what they did is they uh, deleted um, this ALK1 and showed that it reduced growth of cell line and uh, patient-derived xenograft. Uh, CML. So they got patients also cell lines to lead the ULK uh, and show that they didn't grow well. And then using actual native cells isolated from uh, patients with CML, they used pharmacological inhibition of ALK1 um, and showed that it, it reduced the growth by increasing mitochondrial respiration. And here's the key, by inducing a loss of quiescent, quiescence and um, um, resulting in this kind of oxidative stress-induced differentiation of these uh, leukemic stem cells within the CML population. And that, moving them, mobilizing them out of this quiescent state made them vulnerable to the TKIs. And there you go. We've got an adjuvant therapy whereby we can get through this, um, you know, these treatment refractory uh, forms of CML. Yep, that's really neat. I mean, autophagy, as you alluded to, is a really, it's a hot topic right now. It's the basis for a Nobel Prize. It's this kind of cellular recycling eating process that's been implicated in so many different diseases and basic mechanisms as well. Um, here, we're showing that autophagy is linked to CML and, you know, maybe you can regulate this TKI resistance in that way. You know, as somebody who does a lot of work with TKIs, it's um, they are certainly not perfect. They are a massive class of drugs. We're talking about here mostly about imatinib and these CML, uh, BCR able inhibiting TKIs, right? But part of me wonders if some of these autophagy regulating processes could be conserved towards alleviating some of the problems with other TKIs as well. Actually, a major problem with TKIs in general is cardiotoxicity, not really what we're focusing on here. But, you know, I think it's a massive, massive class of drugs. And like you alluded to, there are multiple generations of these drugs. So maybe this is a way that we can make these drugs, you know, even better, even more effective. Yes, that is the hope. Although, you know, whenever you hear this multiple generations, multiple generations, and then I, I'm the cynic in me is like, okay, so well, this is the latest generation. And I get it that it's a combinatorial therapy, but you've got to imagine there's some rogue leukemic stem cell out there that's going to find its way around ALK and the uh, autophagy inhibitors and maybe find another means to stay quiescent. You know, the evolution, we're, we're evolving cancer. We're going to, it's, it's like super bugs. Maybe one day we'll have these super cancers. Although I don't think it's the same kind of process. Um, I just wonder um, if within a specific individual, uh, you get these cancers that continue to evolve and evade the therapy. But, you know, there'll certainly be a few patients that'll live many more days because of uh, this combinatorial therapy. So of course you got to, you got to be a fan. Um, and we're about to talk to a major fan and advocate for all types of therapy, as long as they're not snake oil. Uh, that's Paul Knopfler. But before we get to that, I have a message from Stem Cell Technologies. So Stem Cell Technologies conducted a survey asking scientists to help highlight the hurdles to genome editing using CRISPR. And you can read that survey. Um, report to learn about the most interesting insights on topics such as editing efficiency, downstream viability, and how to overcome them in your research. Visit www.stemcell.com slash CRISPR survey results to learn more. All right, everybody. On this episode, we have a very special guest, a fellow science communicator, one of the first science communicators, especially in the stem cell field. Dr. Paul Knopfler, who's a professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Human Anatomy at the University of California, Davis. The Knopfler Lab is interested in epigenetics and stem cells and cancer. 
His group uses cutting edge molecular, cellular, and developmental biology methods, as well as genomic and gene editing technologies to answer key open questions in these areas of research. As a stem cell scientist and former cancer patient himself, Dr. Knopfler also regularly blogs about regenerative medicine and CRISPR and other new emerging technologies in order to fact check and educate patients about unproven stem cell clinics and other controversial and emerging technologies. But we're going to get into that in the interview. Dr. Knopfler, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for the invitation. It's, it's going to be great to talk to you guys. Yes, it really is a pleasure for us. Really great to have you on the podcast. So for more than a decade, your blog, The Niche, has been the major form for stem cell news and discussion. It was also way ahead of its time, and science communication is evolving along a track that The Niche set out on long ago. How do you think things have changed the most drastically in SciComm in that time? And what do you see is like the next step, the next evolution of how SciComm is kind of changing to suit, uh, you know, emerging science as it stands? Well, thanks for the, the kind words about, um, you know, sort of the pioneering uh, aspect of the niche. It, it did actually feel, uh, to be honest, uh, somewhat of a risk to start a blog as a relatively new assistant professor. This was back in about 20, early 2010. And uh, around that time, as far as I knew, there really was only one other blog about stem cells. And that was run by this big group, Nature. You know, you might be familiar with Nature. Uh, and so they had a, obviously a lot of resources and, and great people who could uh, contribute to that. But in late 2009, they shut their blog down and I had been kind of a fan of that. So I thought to myself, you know, is that something I could do kind of try to fill the space? And so in, in 2010, I thought I'll, I'll just go for it. And I, I thought, you know, um, it'll be an experiment if it doesn't go that well, you know, maybe after a few months, I'll just punt, you know, and I have plenty of other stuff to focus on trying to run my lab. And but it, it was kind of surprising to me that it, it sort of caught on in, in 2010, 2011. People seemed to actually appreciate it. Uh, I was surprised that it, it went from maybe 10 people reading it a day. You know, after a while, it was maybe 100 people reading it a day, which is, I thought that was a huge deal. Um, and, and people left comments. They emailed me about it. So there was like a lot of discussion that kind of was catalyzed by it. But uh, some colleagues, still were somewhat nervous about the idea and they thought, you know, they were kind of advising me, maybe it wasn't such a great idea to be a professor and blogger at the same time. And, and so I think that's one thing that sort of illustrates one big thing that's changed. It seems like now, you know, almost every lab has not only a website, but, you know, you might see people regularly talking to journalists, maybe even having a video on YouTube or something. And so, I think it's just much more accepted now that um, this kind of communication, social media, blogs um, are, are an integral part of science. Back then, when I started, people were much more sort of walking on eggshells about it, I think. Um, so I think that's, that's really one big difference. And I guess I would say now things are much more sophisticated too in terms of science communication. Back then, there was a lot of just, you know, people would maybe summarize recent news in the field or, you know, do almost like a journal club review of a paper or something. But now, you know, there are these sort of, I can see these in-depth discussions between scientists with each other, scientists with patients, and, you know, and you can sometimes even see like the FDA gets in there and we'll do like an on-camera, you know, or live you know, uh, Facebook live kind of thing or something. So there's just, I feel like there's a lot more acceptance of it. There's a lot more sophistication. You know, there's, there's all kinds of complicated uh, video interviews, explaining things, um, having people kind of tell their stories. So it's really kind of cool to see how far we've come in about a decade. And I guess I would just say science communication, it's, it's come a real long way during that time. Hmm. Yeah, no, it definitely has. It's been such an evolution in the last decade, ever since I was an undergrad and an early grad student. The different forms of science communication, as you've alluded to, have just exploded and evolved. 
people who you would have never expected to be on Twitter, on social media, are now on social media, some very prominent senior level scientists interacting with, you know, grad students. And I think that's a really great democratization of science that we've seen. And I'm a big fan of that. But through it all, the niche has been a constant in the stem cell field. And it's actually something that I've subscribed to for years now, close to a decade, ever since my early days in grad school at Stanford. And I still read it every single day. So first of all, I have to say thanks for providing that amazing service to the community for free. And indeed, we've seen a rise in the role of the academic science communicator, like what we've talked about, even to the point where some folks have been able to shift entirely out of academia and make SciComm their full-time job. So what do you think about the rise of that full-time science communicator? And I guess backing up a little bit in the career path, do you think SciComm is becoming something that's so ubiquitous that we could actually encourage it better and earlier during the training process. So talk about, I guess, science communication as a viable career path outside of academia as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And just that SciComm is now sort of its own thing, as well as being a part of academia and a part of biotech. And so I, I would say I definitely see SciComm as a viable career sort of unto itself. And it, it's definitely something that, you know, I would say major universities that are doing all kinds of science, they have whole teams of people now involved in science communication. But then again, even sort of outside of the academic domain, there are people who act as consultants uh, in the science communication area. They have sort of carved out sort of domains unto themselves as science communication com communicators with certain specialties. So I find that exciting. And, and I think you know, it's, it's super tough to make it in academia along the sort of quote unquote traditional pathway where you just imagine yourself ending up being a tenured professor and things like that. The odds are against us making that and there's a lot of luck along the way. Um, and so I think now more than ever, we need to recognize and respect that there are these alternate pathways that are really important unto themselves and science communication is, is one of those. I've seen also people working more in like science illustration and some of these things are kind of interwoven together. Um, I, I've met people who have made these amazing animations like video animations that just really tell a science story in a different way than say just a regular old paper or newspaper article or something like that. So I'm really enthusiastic about just these different forms of science communication. And I guess I see that trend likely continuing in terms of it getting more and more important and respected as its own thing. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, just shifting to the, your scientific focus uh, a bit. One of those has been the critical and comprehensive assessment of direct to consumer marketing of stem cell interventions and the tremendous risk in some cases that these clinics can pose. Um, in the few years since, a couple of your studies you did, you know, three and five years ago, I think, uh, do you think the, in, in the years since, do you think the, the regulatory apparatus has kind of gotten things under control or caught up? Uh, and on a separate note, uh, it seems like mesenchymal stem cells or autologous stem cells are finally kind of turning the corner um, and having their day after becoming nearly synonymous with snake oil. How do you feel about that kind of shift in, in the clinical potential of autologous stem cells? A sort of, do you think that represents a kind of writing of the ship? Yeah, you know, just to kind of get to the sort of first part of the question initially, unfortunately, Although I would say the FDA in the US is doing better in terms of trying to tackle these stem cell clinics, as we call them, for lack of a better term, I still think they're playing catch up, unfortunately. And so there were some of us back in you know, 2013, 14, 15, Lee Turner, especially, um, and I and some others kept having these discussions about, you know, we were really concerned about the clinics. We went to the FDA. But for whatever reason, the FDA really, um, I, I guess maybe they didn't realize the scope of the problem already back then, or they didn't kind of see ahead of years how this was really growing, you know, like uh, an organoid or something, you know, <laughs> like super fast. Um, so um, now I would say for probably the last four or five years, the FDA has been doing a much better job but they got so far behind on these clinics that I think the problem really spiraled and, and now, you know, we've kind of gone from the U.S. Uh, maybe 
12, 13 years ago, almost having none of these clinics now to there probably being a thousand or 1200 mm. of them across the U S. So it's really a mess. And even an agency as powerful as the FDA, I think is really struggling to, you know, kind of wrap its head around it in terms of the leadership and in terms of practical resources is like, what do you do? You can't, you can't really tackle an industry that big as a whole. So anyhow, long story short, I think they're doing much better, but they've, they've got their work cut out for them. So we'll see, we'll kind of see over the next few years, how things go, but at least at the very least they're, they're much more firmly committed to this. They regularly write editorials like in JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine and stuff that like they're really taking this problem seriously. So that's great. Uh, in terms of the cells themselves, I, I do think, you know, for me, I, I mainly have studied over the years pluripotent stem cells, cancer stem cells, but I, I do feel sort of very open and excited about all the different kinds of stem cells that are out there. And I think adult stem cells do have a lot of potential you know, you can't, there's some things you can't do with them easily, like make a brain organoid or do other stuff like that, but they have very specific purposes that I think, um, they're good. They're, they're going to be, I'm convinced they're going to be proven to be helpful, safe and effective in clinical trials for various conditions. And, and in some cases that's already happened. So I do think the MSC field, there's sort of a legit side to it that I'm excited about. I follow it pretty regularly. You know, I think those cells do have properties like immunomodulatory properties that are really going to be valuable for certain conditions. Um, I, I still, I guess I would still say that area of the stem cell field still needs to really keep an eye on the clinics. And, and I would hope, I guess I would hope I would see more of sort of the MSC researchers and academia, the sort of legit side of things kind of stepping up more to sort of take on some of the claims of the clinics out there that are selling the MSCs and stuff. And, and, you know, I guess I can understand why sort of wade into a controversial or complicated area, like trying to confront these clinics if you don't have to, I guess I've sort of chosen to go for it, but um, <laughs> I guess I would hope more scientists would jump in because the truth is, you know, like if you're an MSc researcher at a major university or you're a biotech company doing research on MSCs, it's a real problem if there are a thousand clinics selling various kinds of stuff out there related to MSCs and kind of oftentimes perhaps misleading or, you know, misinforming the public about it. It's a problem for the folks on the other side and you can't just kind of ignore that all that, you know, hundreds of clinics are out there with these infomercials and seminars they're doing. And oftentimes the information associated with those is kind of geared towards just getting more customers. So, hmm. um, yeah, I would say it's still pretty messy, still, still, not totally clear how well the FDA is going to be able to kind of write things um, for that area, but I, I'm more optimistic than I was a few years ago. So that's good. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think part of it, at least when it comes to the MSC side of things has to do, at least in, in my opinion, with the definition of these cells, they're not very well defined. For sure. Their markers aren't necessarily that great. In, in contrast to pluripotent stem cells, which have these kind of well-defined canonical markers, uh, we've been culturing them for years. We know kind of what they are, right? And so your focus has been on a large part on pluripotent stem cells, but it, regardless of whether you're talking about the adult stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, the whole field has been so centered on this idea of hope, right? The hope that the stem cells and their products can unlock in terms of bringing these cures, therapies for a variety of diseases to, to patients and the folks who need them, right? And of course, the, the major funding bodies and the institutions, such as like the different stem cell programs in the USA, the different academic centers, California CIRM, for example, were set up in response to some of these regulations on human embryonic stem cells in the early 2000s, for example. And on the pluripotent side of things, these validated therapies that we've been talking about are actually starting to emerge, right? So for example, in the form of iPSC-derived CAR T cells or natural killer cells that are being used for clinical trials by different startups, um, a variety of other early stage pluripotent stem cell derived products are in the works and iPSC derived cells can be used for drug screening, drug toxicity screening, all those good things, organoid work as well. So where do you think we are now when it comes to the pluripotent side of things? Do you think we can comfortably say that the translational promises of the pluripotent side of the field are being realized? I don't think we're there yet, but I, I kind of share what I'm getting from your tone, which is like a sense of enthusiasm about like, there's like this momentum now. 
Um, as you said, we really have a good sense of what makes these cells tick, how to identify them and be sure quality control wise, like they are what we think they are. And so just, uh, just kind of following the evolution, like for instance, after the discovery or first report of iPS cells, the mouse ones in 2006, the human ones in 2007, I think maybe there was sort of a naive sense that at that point, you know, the sort of controversy over embryonic stem cells would fade away a bit, which I think has happened to some extent. But then there was sort of the second element that quickly the iPS cells were just gonna become the basis for all these therapies within a few years. You know, I kind of shared that enthusiasm. I, I was blown away, to be honest, by the discovery of iPS cells. It made so much sense to me. Uh, being someone who studies like transcription factors and cell fate and all that stuff, it just made so much sense to me. And I, I could kick myself like, why didn't something like that kind of occur to me? I'd even like worked a little bit with my OD, yeah. stuff like that. But anyhow, I think we've kind of come to realize these things take a really long time to get, you know, bench to bedside is sort of that term we often use. But but now you can kind of see that there's a vast array of stuff related to pluripotent stem cells going on that has translational or even these direct clinical applications. So I think we, we just got this amazing momentum right now that's makes me really excited. And, and you mentioned, you know, some of the areas uh, related to iPS cells that I also find really exciting, like the CAR T cell stuff and, and using them for different, like co even combination therapies, you know, cell and gene therapies kind of all in one, I think is, is going to be an exciting area. I'm also really excited about pluripotent stem cell based um, therapies that might emerge for diabetes and macular degeneration as well. Uh, I think, you know, that kind of work we've realized, um, for instance, I'm thinking of the work of Masayo Takahashi in Japan. She's really been a leader in this area. Uh, again, we've kind of learned some hard lessons that this is to get to the clinic is really challenging, but, you know, I think she and the field uh, under her leadership part of the field has come a long way on the vision side and there's other vision work going on. And there's just a lot of logic to the approach of maybe trying to, to go after macular degeneration or other vision loss. And again, like diabetes also, it's, it's really appealing to me as an area that the pluripotent field might be able to address just because you can so readily make pancreatic regenerative cells. You can make even just the beta cell component of it. Um, those areas we know there are trials going on. Biocyte has trials going on. Others are, are moving forward with that kind of approach as well. And I think um, one thing that I think is especially cool is the idea of, of almost like making it's almost like on the stem cell bioengineering side is like making little miniature organs that can help people. And, and again, what kind of comes to mind is almost like these little miniature pancreases in a capsule where there's, there's the bioengineered, the capsule part, you know, and then the, the cellular component and you implant that in people. And, and, you know, it's a, it's a tough road. There's a lot of complexities to it, but I, I see, I feel a lot of optimism there. So I think there is a lot of momentum there. And then even outside of the direct clinical side, you also mentioned, I think, drug testing. We can do disease modeling. And I think pluripotent cells are just so good for those kinds of things as well. And so that's been a huge part, I think, I would say, of the impact of iPS cells as well as just modeling things like with organoids or other kinds of tissues in the lab. You know, making cells from uh, patients, making organoids from patients, testing out different drugs on them all that kind of stuff, I think it's going to be huge moving forward still. Yeah. It's just, I guess, over 20 years since embryonic stem cells were first derived from human embryos. And, and here we are, I think the momentum's on our side. We're moving toward these therapies and across the board, as you said, there's so many ways that they could work. You got to imagine that one of those paths is going to bear fruit, if not uh, many or all. Um, but in the intervening time, we've also had the emergence of other ground, sh you know, shaking, uh, earth shattering, Nobel prize winning technologies like CRISPR, for example. Um, and you, you, uh, dabble with that, although you're renowned as a science communicator influencer, you do run a productive lab and studying epigenetics is a big part of that. Um, and with the proliferation of gene editing tech, uh, clinical applications for disease seem to be at our fingertips there as well. Um, but I don't hear a lot about editing the epigenome, although I, I know it's feasible on, on some level. Uh, do those applications exist? And could you maybe talk about what kind of therapeutic potential uh, a kind of epigenome editing might have uh, for yeah. addressing disease? Yeah, sure. So 
in my lab, we've mainly used the sort of more traditional gene editing where you're actually, you know, changing the makeup of say changing a mutation, say, and, and we've done a lot of work using CRISPR to try to better understand mutations in this histone variant called histone H3.3 that is mutated in um, these lethal childhood brain tumors. So we've been using sort of standard CRISPR approaches to change that mutation back to wild type in brain cells. And, and we've actually learned a lot from that. And we've also introduced the mutation via CRISPR into previously normal brain cells. And together, this has been really interesting for our lab. But we also did consider the more epigenetic side of things. And I think that's something we might um, actually go for. So to, to kind of stick with the example of this childhood brain tumor caused by the H3.3 mutations, um, the patients present with one wild type allele and one mutant allele. So rather than trying to, in a therapeutic sense, CRISPR the mutant allele back to a wild type state, which I think would be basically impossible to do in every one of the you know, billions of brain tumor cells that the patients probably present with. What you could do instead is, is sort of use this adaptation of the CRISPR system where instead of cutting and you know, basically like editing a mutation, you can suppress an entire copy of a gene that say has that mutation. So in the case of these childhood brain tumors, what we could imagine is using the CRISPR system to direct a transcriptional repressor complex to just the mutant allele, not the wild type allele of this gene, and basically just turn that gene off. And I think that might be something that could be done with a much higher efficiency in these tumors, um, as opposed again, to just trying to actually convert the mutation back to a wild type. And in, in the experiments I've seen, this kind of um, CRISPR and uh, transcriptional or epigenomic uh, kind of approach can actually work really well. And, and sometimes uh, this kind of thing takes time to you know, optimize. And I think people are realizing that probably the best way to go about it is use a um, CRISPR-Cas9 kind of machinery where you have multiple repressor domains, for instance, like maybe a histone methylation domain that makes a repressive histone mark and a DNA methylation domain like from DNMT3 or something like that, all in one kind of package that you then, you know, direct via guide RNA to a mutant allele and basically long-term shut that off. And, and perhaps that in that kind of case, maybe in Huntington's disease, other kinds of genetic diseases, you can basically turn off the disease allele. Hmm rather than trying to, to edit it. And, and I guess the additional bonus there is you don't have to worry about accidentally, you know, cutting some other gene if you're using the more, you know, standard CRISPR approach. Uh, I still think, especially with cancer, cancer is, is such a moving target, you know, it evolves a lot that it's still gonna be a, a tough thing to do. But, you know, in some other areas, maybe where things, you know, you just have a single causative mutation, I'm thinking of like sickle cell disease, um, you know, we've already seen some initial reports of CRISPR-based systems uh, where they've actually had some patients who basically don't have much of the sickle cell symptoms anymore after getting, again, sort of a combination of cell and gene therapy, utilizing hematopoietic stem cells that have gone through CRISPR or some other kinds of editing. So I think in that area, you know, uh, there's a lot of promise. And, and again, whether a particular group tries the sort of standard gene editing or more the epigenetic kind of editing that you mentioned, it's probably gonna, you know, they're gonna probably work well. E each of those could work well in different situations depending on the actual nature of the alle allele that's involved. Yeah, it, it's such a powerful technology, CRISPR, and it's, I think part of the power is the ability to multiplex it, like what you've been talking about, adding these like dead Cas9 components, ways you can hyperactivate, silence genes without actually directly editing the genome. I think that's probably the next step for CRISPR and some of those epigenetic modifications are, are certainly a part of that. So we love, you know, awesome, cool technologies here on the show and CRISPR is definitely one of them. And, you know, other technologies that we've talked about are things that are, I guess, relevant to, to the work that you do when it comes to studying the brain, uh, cancers of the brain, like you talked about, and also microcephaly. Uh, one thing we've actually covered a lot on the show through our guests, such as Sergio Pasca and Madeline and Lancaster, and a bunch of recent papers that have come out on the topic is, of course, cortical organoids, right, and helping to dissect some of these mechanisms of brain diseases. Are you incorporating any of those technologies, these cortical organoids, into your lab's work? And what do you think about the efficacy of those organoids to actually model these developmental disorders of the brain, and also cancers, too, in spite of 
of some of the common misconceptions that the public might have about actually how advanced these things are, which they're not. <laughs> yeah, so that I think that was sort of one early lesson for me. We've been we actually have been growing um, coracle organoids in part uh, with help from Madeline Lancaster, just like being willing to zoom a couple times a long time ago to kind of help get us in the right direction. But I, I think it was something we had to realize early in the lab that these are not like sometimes they would go by the nickname mini brains. And they're not really just like a miniaturized shrinky dink, you know, human brain. They're, you know, like the ones we're talking about, they're mainly just like the forebrain. They're in sort of a fetal early developmental stage. So I think we do have to, you know, as science communicators, when we have that kind of hat on, we have to be careful to kind of help as best as we can lay people understand we're not sort of these mad scientists in the lab popping out all these brains or something. But um, yeah, so we've been using them in my lab mainly to try to better understand microcephaly. Um, and for us, the main emphasis has been on the genetic forms of microcephaly, not so much like Zika and stuff like that, Zika-related microcephaly. And we have some initial data that looks pretty cool. We and, and this, again, is sort of incorporating gene editing and stem cells together. So we've been able to make specific mutations in iPS cells using CRISPR then kind of plug those iPS cells into the organoid system and, and basically get, uh, and again, I said, you know, maybe we shouldn't use the term mini brains, but if we want to use that, that term with the mutations, we're kind of seeing even smaller brains, like almost like these little micro brains. Um, so we can kind of see a microcephaly type phenotype. Uh, that also turns out that that has turned out to be some pretty tough research because some of the genes that we're interested in when you CRISPR them in the iPS cells, the iPS cells don't really appreciate that. So some of these genes are important even just in the pluripotent cells as well as in brain development. So getting, getting that all to work out has been pretty challenging, but that, that work is still sort of a long-term project that's still ongoing. But uh, we've also been using the brain organoids to try to model these brain tumors as well. And that, that's been an exciting area that is still also kind of ongoing. So I think there's a lot that you can do there. I like, I find the idea of also doing drug screening using brain organoids pretty appealing as well. Um, I've done a ton of mouse work in my own kind of research career, but I'm also, I'm excited when we can not only use the mice to say, for instance, study microcephaly, but also use sort of more of like a human system basically. And, and again, these brain organoids have limitations, but they're, I find them really interesting um, and, and sort of, at, at the very least, a nice complementary approach to mouse studies. And, and whenever you can do something like in a human 3D tissue kind of context, I find that to me, that's kind of appealing as a scientist, as an approach that kind of goes beyond just the, the mouse studies. Hmm. So just a bit of a shift here back to your SciComm hat. Uh, you gave a really entertaining, ultimately, I would say prescient TED talk about the ethical dilemmas surrounding designer babies. That was at the end of 2015. Right. And within a few years, uh, the Jean Cahay debacle had unfolded. Right. Um, do you think the shock to the scientific apparatus was sufficient to rein in these types of human applications? In this case, you know, design, I don't want to call it designer babies, but any kind of CRISPR, CRISPR edited um conceptus or do you think you know do you think that 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 shock was enough then everyone woke up kind of like you were talking about the fda or do you think that there's still a lot of potential there for rogue actors i definitely think it was a, a good shock um so it's sort of one of those situations where it's 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 messy right there are so many sort of negative aspects to the Hojankui kind of situation, but in some way it did some good. And so I do think my sense is, you know, I gave that TED talk in 2015 and there's just been so many conversations I've had with people before that. And especially after that, that there's sort of a much more cautious sense about going down that reproductive kind of path with, you know, with CRISPR human embryos. And the fact that as far as we know, he ended up going to jail <laughs> That certainly is a pretty big deterrent. Um, on the other hand, I do think there are people, uh, I think there's just a guy, Dennis Rebrikov in Russia, who still seems pretty, at least, you know, he, he voices enthusiasm for eventually doing similar kind of work down the road. He's kind of shifted gears on what specific kind of stuff he might do. There's other people I still hear people talking about that ultimately we should go down that path. You know, we should use CRISPR in human embryos for a reproductive purpose. But um, I, I think the shock might be sufficient to really 
at least delay people doing anything like that for a, quite a few years. I, I think especially some governments have started taking it more seriously. I think in China, they're, they're being much more cautious about how they're overseeing that kind of research. So, uh, you know, here in the US, I think people are, are pretty cautious. And, and so I hear, I guess I would say I hear less sort of chatter about this is going to happen imminently again kind of thing. But, but in 2015, I was pretty worried about it. And, and it wasn't like the idea just popped into my head by myself or something, you know, there was a lot of discussion going on, even in like 2014, that, hey, you know, if you can CRISPR any kind of human cell, the one cell human embryo is a cell, right? So you can do that in, in a human context. People want to do that just for research, which I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of that as long as there's a logical reason to do you know, say you're trying to better understand uh, early developmental gene in terms of what it does in the human embryo, you know, as long as you don't go forward and implant that into a surrogate mother and try to make a baby, I think, you know, you can do that kind of basic research right. And, and I think that's really interesting. So I think we're, we're kind of in a better place in some ways after the whole incident with uh, Ho Kui, but you know, it could be that that will that shock will start to wear off, and as the technology keeps evolving, I know some folks who are are still kind of, at least theoretically, enthusiastic about the idea of using it to tackle human disease in sort of a heritable gene editing kind of way. They still find sort of a, a gravity, sort of a draw of that idea, kind of pulls them in. I think as the technology keeps improving, gets more accurate, we understand it better. There's going to be sort of a temptation for some folks to still at least talk about going down that path. And, and even just talking about it, even if you really have no intent to do it, it still can kind of cause some trouble, maybe by encouraging other people to think that they could actually do it. So I think we have to be really careful about how we talk about it, uh, talk about alternatives like embryo screening. I think that's really important. That's, that's something I've emphasized a lot. You can, you know, you can uh, help families avoid a certain disease um, through IVF and screening embryos through techniques like PGG and things like that. And that's gotten more sophisticated. It's true that that's not, a, that's not gonna fix everything just by screening embryos. Screening embryos has sort of its own complications ethically because you can screen for traits, right? In embryos or genes related to traits rather than just disease causing alleles. And we, I think it was just last week, there was a story about that. Um, from Antonio Regalado at over at a MIT Tech Review about a company. There was some publicity about some of the first babies being born that had sort of been genetically screened as embryos, mm. not necessarily just for disease alleles, but maybe more for like trait related stuff. So long story short, it's a pretty complicated area. I'm still kind of worried about it, but I think uh, certainly people are less inclined to kind of talk in, in sort of dangerous ways about um, designer babies or even just, you know, correct, trying to correct mutations. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I guess just one more thing to add is we've also learned in the last year substantially more about what can go wrong with CRISPR. You, know, you can get these big deletions, these sort of on-target deletions that make it impossible to detect the allele that CRISPR kind of screwed up because like if you're just doing PCR sequencing, maybe you're only detecting this other allele that's wild type and you can still sequence it but CRISPR caused like this 10 KB deletion, you know, on the other allele and you're not even aware that happened. So I think people are kind of have a much more realistic sense of what can go wrong, how to screen for that. We have to kind of be sober about it, I think, based mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of those technologies that has really caught the public's eye. And as somebody who's doing a lot of CRISPR in vitro, I know the reality of how this isn't a perfect technology. And in my opinion, you know, using it for those clinical applications is dangerous. It's, you know, exactly. not, it's not a safe thing to do. Just I sequence the, the iPSCs that I CRISPR, you know, every month. And I see so many of these off target mutations. It's almost like you're taking a shotgun to the genome and just blowing it up. Right. Until oh, yeah. we've really yeah. gotten that precision down and that off target efficacy, you know, clean that up. Uh, we got to be really careful with how we, how we ultimately use the technology, right? And I think part of it is actually educating folks about the science and making sure. sure they understand that this is not a perfect technology and it still needs to be improved. And that's actually, I think that's part of your mission, right? You're an educator, yeah, you're an academic. Um, part, I think it's all of our missions. Like we're science communicators, all, all three of us. And we want to tell people about the realities of these technologies. 
part of it is perhaps to prevent some of those bad, you know, bad actors like we're talking about from taking hold. So education is really critical. And actually, most recently, you've published a really fun new book with your daughter. And that book is titled How to Build a, da- a Dragon or Die Trying. How to Build a Dragon or Die Trying. Pretty cool name. Uh, it's talking about Some of the technologies that we're discussing, like CRISPR, stem cells, bioengineering, to make dragons and other extinct or mythical creatures a reality, kind of maybe Jurassic Park-ish, if I got to think about it. Um, Sort of a a satirical look at cutting-edge science and poking fun at science hype, which, you know, unfortunately there is in the stem cell field, like what we talked about. So tell us a little bit about this project of yours and how you made it happen and how fun it was actually working with your daughter to write this book. Yeah, it was super fun. So it all started because, um, so this is, I have three daughters and this is my youngest daughter, Julie. And and she was sort of faced with one of the standard things a lot of us go through in junior high and biology classes, the science fair is coming up, right? And so the teacher's like, you're supposed to do a science fair project. And and, and Julie's kind of a, a very creative thinker, I would say. And so her older sisters went through the same thing. And so we've attended these science fairs over the years. And oftentimes it's like, it's almost like a Coke versus Pepsi thing. Sometimes, you know, kids will, will do these like surveys of their fellow students and have graphs about who, you know, who prefers what there's been some other really cool things like people looking at what organism they can find in the nearby pond, or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of amazing projects. I don't know why, but Julie decided hers would be more, theoretical. And so she and I often spend long time walking our dog and we have these funny conversations. We sit over the dinner table. You can imagine, you know, with CRISPR and stem cells and organoids all going on in my lab, I'm often like talking to my kids about this stuff. And so uh, somehow the idea came up of making these other kinds of creatures, I think it was over the dinner table. And so Julie pitched the idea to her teacher for her science fair project. Her teacher was like, yeah, go for it. And so her poster was just kind of going through how you could use stem cells and CRISPR and things like that to try to make a dragon. And then I was like, you know what, we should write a book about this. And she was all (laughs) for it. So we just kind of did, you know, and it was really fun um, working with her on that, collecting all these different images. So that was one thing we both wanted is to have a book that had lots of really cool kind of science and nature related pictures like Komodo dragons, things like that. So that was really fun. And it, it's really funny because after the book came out, you know, kind of going through giving talks, talking to people, I, I think some people thought we were actually serious about it, which was kind of funny. Um, you know, we did include sort of that subtitle on, you know, the satirical look at science and stuff, but I have actually gotten emails from people saying, you know, can you help me build a dragon <laughs> or can you help me build a unicorn or something like that? Wow. And actually, <laughs> you know, probably building a unicorn wouldn't be as bad as trying to build a dragon. But so anyhow, it was, it was just super fun and it got her more into science for sure. And, and just kind of thinking also about sort of the history of science, how things can get overblown. Um, so that was that was sort of a fun, fun project. Um, and I would definitely you know, do something like that again, if one of my kids wanted to do a a project like that, it was, it was just so fun. Once again, I'd say you're a bit prescient there. You scooped uh, George Church a little. I don't know if you guys heard, he started this company to bring back the woolly mammoth with like $50 million of funding. So yeah, you're on the right track. You and your daughter, both Julie, it could be you go work for George. (laughs) Um, anyway, that's fun. I mean, a little, there's so much, uh, kind of science adjacent in your life as a communicator, we could talk for hours. Uh, about it all. I mean, you were on Bill yeah, Nye, sure. you've done it all. Uh, but we'll have to bring you back for another show because our time's up for now. But for a couple of science peripheral questions that we'd ask, uh, if you're willing, the first is, what is one hobby that you've always wanted to pursue, but were never able to? Yeah, so I've always wanted to play a musical instrument, but I just don't <laughs> seem to have any knack for it, unfortunately. And especially the guitar, I've always, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to play the guitar. And so I think it was fourth grade, I started guitar lessons. And after like a week, my fingers hurt. And so I kind of gave up. And I've maybe two or three other times throughout my life tried to pick it up again. One time I was a little more serious about it. It lasted maybe a couple months, but somehow I just, you know, maybe it's just, I don't have the talent for it, or I just need to like persevere despite having these huge calluses on my hands. So Wish, wish I could do something like that. 
it's well, fit. you are talking to the right guy because I have a parallel story. I picked up, dropped the guitar multiple times in my life. I think oh, really? it was the pa- yeah, it was the yeah. one of the rare positives of the pandemic where I had a little bit more downtime. So oh, yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to learn some of those basic chords and you go from there. So yes, it took a little while to get used to the pain and build the calluses, but yeah. you can do it, Dr. Nopler. I believe. I know. I, I really need to like stick with it. I, 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 you know, stuck with things so long in my life. I've been good about it, but with the guitar, for some reason, my, my uh, tolerance is, is too low, but I'm going to, I'm going to go back to it again. I'm sure I bought a guitar. So I got to, I've got to. Paul, you got to hang in there so you and Arun can start the uh, stem cell jam band. I would, <laughs> yeah. I would come out yeah, for that. Let's do it. For sure. <laughs> Finally, uh, if you were not a scientist, what would you be? I mean, you're everything already. So it can't be one of the things that you already are. If you're not a scientist, what do you think you'd be? I, I think there's a pretty good chance I would have been a farmer. Um, I, there's, there's sort of a long line of farmers in, on one side of my family. And I, I do love gardening, um, but I always sort of, not always, but I often kind of bring it back to science. I'm wondering, you know, staring at a tomato or something, I'm thinking about the cells and, you know, oh my God, plants have stem cells. I get, you know, off on a tangent on that one. I'm trying to, I should be just focusing on the garden and stuff. But ever since I was a kid, I love digging in the earth planting stuff. So I, I, I think there's a pretty good chance I would have been a farmer, but I probably would have been one of those farmers who's always playing with gadgets, you know, and having robots out in their field, looking at their plants, measuring humidity, things like that. So I, I'm pretty sure I would have been a farmer. Well, you've uh, sown many seeds of knowledge and the trees are, uh, are bearing fruit, Dr. Knopf. Oh, that's kind of you to say, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty weak metaphor, but I had to say something. Anyway, you've been a great guest and uh, you really are a shining light for the entire stem cell community and beyond. So I just want to thank you personally on behalf of a lot of people who I think appreciate your efforts to get outside of that traditional track and really, you know, blaze a new trail for all the science communicators who came behind you, including Arun and myself. So thanks. And thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great. All right. That brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. We had a major innovator and science communicator on this episode. It was a lot of fun. Thank you guys for joining us and tune in again in a couple weeks. We'll have someone else for you and our usual roundup of recent news and stories in stem cells. Mm-hmm.